Recently, the Potomac Conference, against the voted position of the World Church, ordained Joanne Cortez to the gospel ministry. The Columbia Union was complicit in this act not recognized by the World Church. The great escalation that has occurred now sees officers from the North American Division, which is over the Columbia Union and itself is part of the 13 World Offices of the General Conference, actually participating, these officers actually participating in this act of insubordination just 17 miles from World Church headquarters. Friends, Jesus told a parable, you've heard it before, God sowed good seed in his church, but while men slept, the enemy came sowing darnel into the wheat. Darnel is a weed. Superficially, it, it kind of looks like weed. But God's enemy is adept at creating fake ideas and distributing them among the truthful ones. When you become part of a church, you have read your Bible, you understand something about God's purposes for his world and for his church, you anticipate arriving at the destination that God has set. We joined ourselves to Jesus and his church, anticipating what? A Bible faith. We want a thus saith the Lord for how we live out our Christianity. How then is it that so often we see smiling, blank-faced people advocating for the same social justice packages advocated in godless secularism? Now, there are different destinations. God's plan is to prepare as many as possible for translation, to enable them to pass through the time of judgment, keeping true to Jesus all the way. Now, there is also a satanic agenda to overturn God's created order, to rewrite the world and recreate it after other ideas in a creaturely image. There is no God, some think. So they volunteer to be God for the rest of us. So they will redistribute things better than they were originally distributed. They treat the Bible merely as a primitive starting place. Uh, they want to build out from the Bible. They want to continue advancing past Old Testament morality, you know, to a superior New Testament morality. And from there, they want to go on to even better trajectories of justice. But these new trajectories are just photocopies of secular schemes. Secular schemes? Well, maybe you've heard of some of these things. The world is a danger from overpopulation, and the church suddenly sets out a statement on birth control. The earth is at risk because of changing weather. So the church releases a statement echoing that idea. The earth is at risk because of a new disease. So the church dutifully complies with its edicts, stripping away freedoms just as speedily as the world demands. What the regime says, the church does. Why is that? But why WO? Why women's ordination? What is the bigger picture here? Why are some so bent on placing women in positions God has designed to be filled by spiritually qualified male leaders? So Satan has one and only one opportunity. He must undermine God's order. As God enlists participants to uphold his order, Satan enlists participants to undermine God's order. In the Bible, only spiritually qualified males are appointed to positions of elder. 1 Timothy 3, 1-7. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So that talking about a spiritually qualified male, isn't it? So let's go over here to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. Here's another example case. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remained and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Uh, those are Bible, some examples of Bible commands that tell us that our 
people we ordain would be spiritually qualified males. That's what God designed. So this doesn't mean, by the way, that one sex is superior to another. It is simply that God, who designed basic male and female physiology, basic male and female mental and psychological dispositions, God set up this order. So from Genesis to Revelation, primary spiritual leadership is consistently male from one end of the Bible to the other. God's prophet thunders against the unfaithful in Isaiah 2, verse 6. He says that God abandons his people, quote, because they are filled with influences from the east and they are soothsayers like the Philistines and they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. In chapter 3, verse 12 of Isaiah, O my people, their oppressors are children and women rule over them. O my people, those who guide you, lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. See, God has foretold here, we just read it, that other agendas would be brought in from outside the Bible. We are a Bible church. Then, then when people consider becoming part of the church, will we be surprised when they evaluate the church based upon what they see in their Bibles? Women's ordination is anti-evangelistic because it is a practice rooted in a different religious system. Second wave feminism is rooted in humanism. It attempts to undermine and de-instantiate God's world order. The convenient thing is to roll along, of course, with the currently preferred world order, just go along with the regime, but God does not call us to the convenient thing, nor did we sign up for the convenient thing. Friends, if North American Division headquarters officers can lead the church toward the convenient thing, leading out in ordinations even, which the world church has forbidden, well then where are we? The NAD is itself part of the general conference. Some people don't understand this, but it's, it's not an additional layer of church governance. The NAD is literally the North American office of the general conference. It is the general conference. For officers then of the NAD to participate in the ordination of a woman is rebellion at the highest level. If there's no accountability there, then why should we support the North American division in any respect? If the NAD can do whatever it wants, we're no longer really even a Bible church. You know, you can set this aside. We, we won't be needing that anymore. If they can do this this year, what can they do and what will they do next year? Really, you're in a spot where anything goes. Friends, may I urge you to join me in exercising your Protestantism? Possibly your Protestantism has, is getting rusty. But has the enemy succeeded maybe in demoralizing you? Do you feel that any kind of action on this is just kind of hopeless? Well, if so, maybe the enemy has uh, got you partway demoralized. But if Jesus ever felt that way, you know, Jesus resisted it anyway. You, We can, we, you and I, we can and we must resist in the same way that Jesus did. Would you join me in, this is a call to action, this is straightforward. It's a call to action. Would you join me in preparing a less than a minute long video letter to NAD President G. Alexander Bryant, who, as I said, is also a general conference vice president. He is the single individual especially responsible to the general conference for upholding world church policy in North America. Now, watch this video to learn more if you want to learn some more about that. Focus your attention on this individual. Help him discover faithfulness in doing his duty to uphold the world church's biblical position, its biblical decision not to permit divisions or other units to unilaterally engage in illegal ordinations. Now, if you need help sending me your video file, you're having trouble getting it off your phone and sending it across on an email or something, I'm going to link right above here to a playlist I've created that has video instructions. There's a couple of videos in there for how you can send me your video file. It's actually quite easy. You don't have to spend any money. It's just take a look at those if you need that kind of help. Friends, somewhere I read this solemn call to action. Quote, if God abhors one sin above another of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency. Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. We're told that that's a crime that God's people are guilty of. If we don't do anything about this, we'll be guilty of it all over again. That would be sad. At least let's not, you and I, be guilty of this crime. Make your concern felt 
And I want to thank you today for your time and attention. God bless you, and God bless his church. It's not too late to fix this, but it is very late in the hour.